Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Okay, that's your cue to like. Okay. Turn around. Look at me. Listen. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm Palma Strand. I am um, a member of the faculty in the NCR program and director of the 2040 Initiative, which focuses on changing demographics and how to have conversations about identity and equity, and here we are today. Um, I want to just really quickly introduce the other members of the NCR um, team. Jackie Fonkusan, who is our director. Welcome. Amanda, I see Amanda. Doug Guidero in the back, Kathy Gonzalez, was coating water at one point. I think she might be out of the room. Sarah, the singer, is our academic coach, and Bertie Mayer, who I will introduce separately in a minute. Is that everybody? There's Kathy. I also wanted to um, introduce um, very briefly Cindy, Dr. Cindy Constanza, who's the uh, chair of the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies at least in my thought I saw her. She's in the back corner trying to keep a low profile. <laughs> okay. And Kelly Herring, who is running the mediation residency, which is of course why I, um, why I forgot Kelly, who's, who's taking a break from the mediation residency. So welcome to everybody. Um, this is our uh, third Speaking Truths panel, um, and it's Standing Up for Justice at Creighton, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, and more. Um, and um, I, I'm going to just say a few words about sort of how this came about. So it sometimes seems, often seems like, kind of social, social injustices sometimes seem to be everywhere. And um, I think feel like today they're being named and, and made visible in a way that sometimes they weren't before. And, um, you know, there's Black Lives Matter with racism in law enforcement and more structurally. There's the Me Too movement about sexual harassment and hostile work environments and power. There's shootings and guns, uh, DACA and Dreamers and immigration issues. There's the devastation in Puerto Rico, uh, followed by uh, this followed Hurricane Maria and issues having to do with discussions about reproductive rights on campus. So we found ourselves asking the question, so what does it mean to stand up for social justice? And particularly, what does it mean to stand up sort of where we are at Creighton? Um, and so today we've got four panelists who we invited to share their experiences and reflections. And I'm just going to introduce them briefly, but each one of them is someone who, when we thought about who stands up for social justice at Creighton, these people came to mind, and they stand up in different ways and from different places, but that's kind of part of why having this conversation is important. So in order, uh, Dr. Erica Kirby, who's professor of communi communication studies and holder of the Jackson Chair in, uh, Jacobson Chair in communication. Uh, Fallon Watts, who is the coordinator for recruitment, retention, and assessment in student support services, and she's also the current chair of the Committee on the Status of Women here at Creighton. Uh, Shay Owafe, who is a student working towards a joint degree in law and um, negotiation and conflict resolution, and also the president of the Black Law Students Association. And Dr. Kevin Graham, who is a professor of philosophy here, and until recently, just recently, director of the Magis Core curriculum in the College of Arts and Sciences. And uh, moderating the questions, I'm going to disappear after I end here in a minute. Uh, the questions and discussions is Dr. Bernie Mayer, who's a member of our NCR faculty, well known for his work in writing on conflict and kind of reflecting on conflict and experience, author of um, Dynamics of Conflict, Staying with Conflict, The Conflict Paradox. Um, and we've invited each panel, I just want to shout out to Dr. Uh, Chris Witt, who just walked in the room, sorry about that, who's our new Vice Provost for in, uh, Institutional Diversity and Inclusion. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. So anyway, we've invited each panelist to um, introduce themselves and talk for a few minutes about what social justice issues they care about and why, and what they do at Creighton to stand up for these issues. Okay, um, we were told to talk first about why we said yes to this panel. So um, 
In thinking about why I said yes to be on this panel, first and foremost, I was honored to be thought of in this way. I actually kind of wondered if I had really anything important to say, so I hope I have some flashes of wisdom for you today. And I'm actually going to start by sharing with you uh, two very personal items to me. The pillows that I see every day in my recliner across from my desk when I am working. So the first one are the Fists of Revolution, and the second one is something you may or may have not seen before. When you are accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. So I sort of look at these every day as I'm working. Activism has been an increasingly significant part of who I am, and I can honestly say I was not this activist person when I came to Creighton 20 years ago. The longer I have been at Creighton, the more committed to social is justice issues I have become. Indeed, when I put together my proposal to be the AF Jacobson Endowed Chair in Communication, my entire platform was based on communicating social justice. So I hope to bring more of these issues to the forefront in the years to come on campus. But in terms of what I found myself most compelled to speak about in and out of the classroom in recent years, I thought I would highlight three social justice issues, racial justice, mental health, and speaking up on sexual assault and women's issues. So first of all, Standing up for racial justice. Um, I have personally been very moved by the Black Lives Matter movement, and so I attended demonstrations in Omaha in the summer of 2016. And so I was really excited when students on our campus also decided to demonstrate in fall of 2016. But I was actually, um, while I was celebrating them, a little annoyed with some, some aspects of how campus handled it, that there was a press release by 11 a.m. on the first day that these students had permission to do it and to let people know if they got in the way of your everyday activities. And the reason I kind of like, that struck me is that when I see little tiny baby shoes on St. John's Church, we don't get the same warnings about if this disturbs you, please let, it, let people know. So um, I sort of took that as a way to talk to my classroom about how sometimes we prioritize different social justice issues at Creighton and how do we make those decisions. Um, my department was very moved by this to the so strongly that we actually posted as a department in Facebook in solidarity with the students, and here's what we said. We declare our solidarity with students who are giving voice to the plight of systemic racism and violence in calling attention to injustice and by declaring hashtag Black Lives Matter. These students have put themselves at the heart of the mission of this university. We are honored to share the Creighton community with them. But there was backlash about posting as a department, and we can talk about that later. I have also created a course for the Majus core on being color brave, race, power, privilege, and difference that has been taught to returning adult students for the past three years now and that I hope to be able to share with our traditional 18 to 19 year old um, students soon. And most recently in terms of racial justice, as the Jacobson Chair, I sponsored a program in November um, of 2017 where we aired several of Father Brian Massingale's talks, clips of them on racial justice from talks that he had given at the Ignatian Family Teaching in the fall, as well as the Justice Conference in Seattle in August, and sort of did some clips and had people talk about in small groups about racial justice. I really think we need to do more on this here at Creighton, and so I'm actually looking at Loyola Marymounts. They have a training program on racial justice for their staff and faculty as a possible Jacobson program to co-sponsor with others. So that's some things about racial justice. Um, I'm also a staunch advocate for standing up for and normalizing mental health issues. I guess I must be pretty outspoken about this in and out of the classroom because just this week I can think of two examples when people came to me for advice about how to handle these situations. One was about cutting and one was about suicidal ideations. I think it's because I really feel free to bring these issues into class based on personal and family experiences. Um, the odds are that in a class of 25, you have multiple students who are facing this issue in some way. And so I often put myself out there, indeed I will right now, and tell the students, you probably see me as normal, but I'm on depression medication. And I want you to know that that's okay, and there shouldn't be any stigma attached to that. And so I try to open up space in my classroom to talk about depression, anxiety, OCD, eating disorders, if students want to bring it up in the classroom, or just to know that they can see me privately about that. Um, I had a student email me after spring of last year and say, I knew I should have been doing something, but I finally had the courage to after you said that you did so too, because I saw you as, I'm going to put quotes around normal again, right? So um, I think that that has made a difference on campus. And then finally, um, 
As a feminist, I call out issues of injustice surrounding women and especially violence against women, where and if I see them. Um, once upon a time, I brought the vagina monologues to campus amidst a lot of controversy. Um, and then recently, I feel like I have um, been called to stand up for women over the past 15 months related to issues of sexual violence. I was appointed to serve on the presidential task force about sexual assault and then turned over as to a member of the Title IX committee that now exists. And I'm so excited to be on that committee and especially that I serve in the education role because I am trying to, as a faculty member, put um, those issues in more places. Right now I'm working to talk about bystander intervention in the uh, Ratio Studiorum class for freshman students. And I'm working with a group of committed students who might want to bring a chapter of Know Your Nine, which is a student-run organization to talk about Title IX issues um, to our campus. And I also worked with uh, Dr. Kevin Graham in speaking out to protect the VIP staff in the fall, but I know he's going to talk a little bit more about that. So hopefully this gives a little taste of what I've been doing to stand up for social justice on campus, and we can always do more, but I do feel like I've at least done something. Thanks. Um, I'll also just echo too that when I was approached to be on this committee or be on this panel, I was kind of taken aback. Like, hey, you guys want me? Like, um, I'm just a staff member here. Um, just kind of coming to work to do my thing, do my job, go home. Um, but Palma said, you know what? No, Alan, you are you're doing more than just doing your job, going home, and you're doing more than that. Um, so. For me, I'm that person that likes to be behind the scene, if that makes sense, um, just to kind of gradually do my work and speak about different issues behind the scene, not not caring to be so front line. Um, and so I'm learning that it's okay to be behind the scenes, but then sometimes you have to be front line and um, be on panels such as this to say, you know what, I am doing something, I am making a, I am making a change, I am trying to be that person that can speak on injustices that have personally affected me or um, in or have personally affected me or have not personally affected me. Um, so for me, why I feel um, the need to speak or serve is because I have personally been um, been affected firsthand or experienced um, injustices because I am a black woman. And so those are issues that are near and dear to me. Um, women's issues, <coughs> racial issues. Um, and not because I've disobeyed the law or anything like that, not because I've not paid my taxes, um, but merely because I'm a black woman and that is why I've experienced injustices. And so those issues are very personal to me. Um, so for me, having again the opportunity to be on panels such as this, to serve as the chair of the Committee on the Staff for Women, um, to have that platform and that voice to say, you know what, it's not right. Um, let's bring light to these issues. Um, I also serve on the Title IX Advisory Committee um, where I am learning a lot about the, the sexual <laughs> mishaps and misconduct issues and things of that nature um, that are taking place not only on Creighton's campus but also outside of Creighton's walls and those <laughs> issues that are becoming more and more um, prevalent and more of a passion for me. Um, but again, um, for me, it's just it's just doing the right thing. It, it sounds really cliche, I guess, but honestly, to me, that's just what it is. It's just doing what's right and knowing what's right and what's wrong. Um, but for me, I do feel the need um, and the value of humanity, um, greatness, of diversity. And so if I have the opportunity to speak about that, um, I... I gladly take any platform that I can to speak about that with individuals, with the students that I work with directly um, or indirectly. And so ultimately for me, um, I want to be that individual, whether it's on Creighton's campus or outside of Creighton's walls, um, to encourage diversity, encourage women empowerment, um, promote change when change is needed, and be that voice to say, you know what, you can do things, you can stand up for, and you can stand up for issues that, that are unjust. Um, but in a in a more laid back kind of way where you don't have to be so front line um, all the time. Mm -hmm. 
Good afternoon. My name is Shea Olafe. I'm a uh, 2018 candidate for George Stockton as well as my master's in conflict resolution negotiation. Uh, I will say that I um, when I got invited to speak on this panel, I probably freaked out <laughs> <laughs> because the it gave a sense of self-reflection of what have I done and. Um, I came on this campus uh, last year, um, fall of 2016, and I jumped into the accelerated jurisdiction program. So I'll finish my jurisdiction in two years, as well as my conflict resolution in two years. But when I came on this campus, I looked around a uh, orientation group of 120. Mm -hmm. I saw one other African American male and one African American female in the entire class of 2019 for jurisdiction. At that time, I looked around and said, okay, this is much like how I grew up, <coughs> suburban Michigan. I was the only African-American male in my entire class of 286 students. Um, nothing out of the norm for me. However, uh, as we pr proceeded through the semester and realized how much of a lack of, there was a lack of support for minority students, um, this doesn't just start from administration standpoint or just a community standpoint. Um, there was a lack of um, guidance. I didn't have anybody in my family or knew anybody who had been interned before. And for those of you who know anything about law school, it's, it's a rigorous and grueling time, especially that first year. Um, so we bonded together. In fact, the, the students who were minorities above us somewhat took of a more selfish approach. And it was to each his own. Mm -hmm. And so this past fall, um, when a colleague asked me, hey, um, we're reinvigorating uh, the Black Law Student Association. Uh, well, she didn't say that. She asked me, Shay, how much do you love me? <laughs> <laughs> and like a sucker, I said this much. <laughs> Then she asked me your question. <laughs> Hook, line, sinker. Uh, here I sit, sit before you as the president of Black Law Student Association. <coughs> In that time, we have set out to do four key things. One is the academic support. Uh, in the fall, we held a 1L midterm panel, uh, much like you see here today, but it was not for solely minority students. It was for the community at large. It was simply to support those who didn't, didn't come from a privileged background and knew how to navigate law school. It came from a sense of, we're gonna make sure that everyone has the same opportunities and to experience what others do in order to have that success and academic success. I will tell you, and I don't tell many people, yes, I did reach the top one third of my class in my first 1L semester. However, even those accomplishments came through hard work and, and figuring things out on my own where several of my other privileged classmates had people who already taught them how to navigate through law school. Mm -hmm. The second thing we did was professional development. And this comes into a matter of we ensured that we got ourselves uh, connected with our regional uh, Midwest balsa. So this past January and February, we sent a, a team down to compete in the Frederick Douglass New Court which, to be honest, I don't remember a time when Crane has actually participated in a BALSA event. And BALSA is a student-run organization that's national, is the only student-run organization that's nationally recognized and nationally ran. In doing so, our team, without support, without coaching, did extremely, extremely well. We were the only school that had no coach. So I sit back and say, yes, we sit and I start the foundation of not necessarily of me participating, but it's a matter of what comes after me. Furthermore, on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, we had the privilege of having uh, Reverend Fred Gray uh, come to this campus. And if you don't know who Fred Gray is, he was the attorney for Rosa Parks. And in that conversation and dialogue, we learned that social justice isn't a matter of, I per se, staying outside and marching around with a picket or a sign and saying, I'm, or taking a knee. 
we all have a role, and the role is individualized to each other. Fred Grace sat there and said he's never once got involved in the financing of, of civil rights. It wasn't his role. His role, just as Fallon had indicated, was behind the scenes as an attorney to give a voice to the voiceless. So I sit here before you today and say, yeah, I look back at my time here at Crane and I didn't think I did much. But I will tell you that my purpose for being here is because it wasn't what I've done individually, but it's what I, I laid the foundation for tomorrow. For those minority students that come after me and having the support that I didn't have. That's the reason I sat here today. I live in Graham. I teach philosophy in the College of Arts and Sciences. It is an honor to be on this panel with each of these guys. Um, so, uh, I think it's important for us to stand up for justice at Creighton University because we're a university. Okay? And the university has a kind of dual role, right? I mean, we need to help students adapt to the world as it is because those students need to become uh, professionals, they need to become citizens in the world that currently exists. And if we can't reliably do that, um, people aren't paying $30,000 in tuition, $50,000 total cost of attendance to come here. Okay, so that role is very crucial, but the university also has a role of transforming the society that we're in and making this democratic republic a better version of itself. And in order to do that, we need to be capable of self-transformation, of making our university a better version of itself. And that goes for any university, whatever its mission. This is a Jesuit and Catholic university, right? So the, uh, the goal here is bringing about the kingdom of God on earth, right? So the stakes are a little higher, okay? So those are the reasons why it's important for me to speak up for social justice. Now, I just want to talk about two things that I've done over the course of my 22 years at Creighton University just to illustrate two different kinds of work that I think it's really important for faculty in particular to do. One is sustained work over the long haul towards long time horizon goals about social justice. When I came to Creighton University uh, about a year after I joined the faculty, 1997, I joined the Sexual Orientation Issues Task Force, which is a, was a small, unofficial, not endorsed by anybody, not getting credit for this on your annual review, um, <laughs> group of people who thought there is not enough justice here for LGBTQ persons, okay? And we think that's wrong. And it was a bunch of us who were basically non-tenured faculty members and at-will staff employees in campus ministry, res life, and the counseling center. Okay, and a couple of Jesuits, God love them, who provided us political cover. All right, so the two roles that we had to, uh, were to um, create programming that provided a space to talk about issues that were of interest and concern to LGBTQ persons, right? So there was a space on this campus where that stuff could get talked about, where there weren't a lot of spaces for that stuff to be talked about. And over the long haul, to lobby doggedly for the creation of a gay-straight alliance and for the um, inclusion of sexual orientation in the non-discrimination clause of the university. Finally, and for, so this was a long slog. It was like a walking through mud for seven years, okay? And people had been doing it before I got there. But uh, in 2003, we achieved our historical mission, died, and ascended to heaven, right? Those two, those two goals achieved, we were done, all right? And that kind of stuff doesn't happen unless faculty members get involved because the students, who are some of the primary beneficiaries of this stuff, they're not around long enough, right? People, you know, Shane is going to be gone, right? 
Yeah, so <laughs> Shane's gonna be gone, and so uh, people are around for a couple of years, and they uh, and they set up a a, 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 like a black lawsuits association. Mm -hmm and they provide for the future and then they leave and someone else has to pick up and faculty have to be doing that steady dogged work for years do you want to work on uh, issues of sexual orientation and gender in the catholic church and catholic institutions you better be prepared to work in geological time <laughs> <laughs> all right so the second thing i want to say just very briefly is there's another kind of thing where you can do a swift intervention on an, on an issue that um, urgently needs it so dr kirby mentioned uh, our collaboration on the um, issue to do with the vip center so basically long story short um two staff members of the vip center uh wrote a letter to the Craytonian protesting the use of university resources to make an award to a former uh, member of an athletic team who had uh, been charged with rape, and all of the charges were later dropped. Um, they raised questions about that, and the university publicly said in an article on the World Herald, we're putting those folks under review. Okay, so this is this was indicating their jobs were under threat, and. Uh, as staff members, they had to be worried about that. And staff members can't afford to speak up about that stuff. It's got to be faculty who have the protection of tenure. It has to be us. So Erica and I spent, what, about 48 hours pulling together letters that we, uh, and, and, I, and uh, get, I gathered 50 signatures on my letter and sent those letters to academic leadership and say, do not under any circumstances take job action against these staff members. That would be wrong. You should be standing with them, not against them. Okay? And uh, the job action was taken, so, uh, so far so good. All right? But that's the kind of thing that can be done swiftly um, if, if you're willing to put the time in and you know, figure out some time other than t two days before uh, Thanksgiving break to do all the grading, but you have to do it at that point. <laughs> so those are, those are two ways that I have worked to stand up for uh, social justice while I've been at Creighton University. Thank you. And I'm very honored to be on moderating this panel with all of you. Um, so, as somebody who's been part of many social justice movements in my own life, I know that if we're not getting pushback, we're probably not doing what needs to be done. Um, it's easy to sort of stand up for things that are easy to stand up for because the time is right for it. But issues like, the, you know, that you've mentioned, I don't have to uh, go through them all, and currently in our, our our world as a whole, our society as a whole, that um, are really about changing things, are going to get pushed by. And for example, the, the, we're seeing that with the Me Too movement, uh, as just uh, one example. Uh, so I want to know, and you've all alluded to pushback, and some, some more explicitly than others, how much does Craig walk his talk? I mean, it says it's open, it says it wants to hear things, it says it's committed to social change and social justice, but how much does it walk its talk? And to what extent do you face special obstacles here, despite what Creighton says about its values, and to what extent are there really some special opportunities here because of the nature of the institution as well? So I'd like to hear a little from you, from you all about that. Whatever order you want to go. Well, I, I know I brought it up explicitly, so um, I can talk about it um, a little bit. I mean, I felt, I actually felt like the press release saying, like, these people have permission was a little bit of backlash because we don't see it against everyone who demonstrates. But furthermore, um, when our department spoke publicly, then a few other departments said, can we join you in speaking publicly on behalf of the students? And so we put another department on there, and then they said, why don't we put this out to all departments to see if they want to be on there? And that led to some people being uncomfortable, taking it to the faculty council, who then came to my dean, who then came back to us and said, you cannot speak as a department on these issues ever again. And it was 
bewildering to me why we couldn't take collective action to just say we support the students in this. Um, and so when we were having the introductory meeting to this, uh, I think Bernie said, well, what would happen if you just kept doing it anyways? And so who knows, maybe we'll just keep doing it anyways. Um, but it was an interesting question to think about, right? Like, you can protest in this way, but not this way. I mean, I think that we've seen that with take the, taking a knee movement and everything. Like, we, we want you to be able to protest, but not this way, and not this way, and not this way. Um, and then um, something that Kevin didn't say is that I tried to go through the faculty council on behalf of the VIP staff members and got shot down immediately that they would not take any action in that way of putting forth a motion to support the staff. So to me, that was backlash of, like Kevin said, faculty has the protection to be able to do this. Faculty council is the, is the arm of the faculty to be able to put that through. And I felt like I was patronized and said, like, why would you think this is a faculty issue? Well, it's a faculty issue because it's a justice issue. Um, and so that's at least two spaces where I guess just in the past year and a half, um, I think I have seen some pushback. So, uh, yeah, so on the sexual orientation issues task force, it was kind of unpredictable what we would get pushback on. We got pushback on the weirdest stuff. So we did some programming that was really kind of out there, but the, the, uh, the title didn't seem to indicate that, and it just goes right under the radar. <laughs> then we had the most harmless video that we showed from like any TV called Coming Out in Rural Nebraska. I mean, you could have showed it to anybody, you know, all audiences, right? Um, wow, you know, we've, I, we've released the notice on that and within 12 hours I had a cabinet level administrator screaming in my ear on the phone about how can you possibly do this? Right, because the idea was somehow coming out in rural and west was like recruiting gay people, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, so uh, the, 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 the way I dealt with pushback in that situation was I always had the Jesuits as my backup, especially Father Bert Thielen, SJ, uh, then uh, pastor of St. John's Church. I always had his permission to say, you know what? think you're going to have to talk to Father Bird about that. Okay. Uh, so it, it, it's partly about building uh, really well-placed, totally fireproof allies. And I'll just echo that. Um, I think from a staff perspective, it's it's a little more nerving to, to speak out on certain issues to say, you know what, I do I do think this is right or I do think this is wrong because it is that 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 thought behind that constant thought to say, well, Jesus Christ, my, my job might be in jeopardy. Um, and so I do think, though, Creighton, they have the opportunity to, um, they have the opportunity um, to, to build relationships and to walk the walk a lot better than what they're currently doing. Um, I've been here, or not, I've been at Creighton for about four years, and so I'll be very direct to say Creighton is a very white campus, and so it has the opportunity to um, diversify its campus from staff, faculty, to students. And so going back to what Bernie was saying, um, on different issues, as far as uh, walking the walk, it, it talks the talk to say we are a campus of inclusion, but is it really when you start to look out, look at the numbers of your faculty, your staff, your your leaders that are of color, that are minorities, that are female? So that's just my perspective. I would concur with that. The it's always ironic when someone says we want to be diverse, and then you look and say what are they doing to be diverse, and when it comes to the law school particularly, um, you know, we, they put on a good front and show. Uh, however, when it comes to the actual support to, you know, whether it's the resources of time, um, uh, instruction, uh, dedication, it's, yeah, we'll, we'll be there. You can just go set it up and do everything. And, and then when you come back with a trophy, then we'll, we'll say we're there with you. Um, <laughs> and, and, and essentially, it's a matter of, it, that's not enough. It's, it's not enough to have one African American female as a faculty member that 
um, quite frankly, um, you know, it's very hard to approach. It's very hard to, to find somebody who's going to look out after, you, you know, who's gone through what your struggles are to relate to. Um, it's very difficult and what you've been res resorted to is finding other sources outside of that structure, outside of that, that, that school. And so, yeah, the obstacle is really coming to the structure of itself. Um, the institution itself, um, the way the norm has become. Uh, as Fallon has put it, I am now one of only two African-American males out of three years of classes in the Curry Law School right now. Um, and you're considering nearly 300 people, 300 students, and I'm one of two African-American males. And so to sit here and say that, you know, we're having a push for our diversity, I've seen better. <laughs> um, <laughs> Just the numbers don't don't add up to what is being said, but in the same sense, it's a matter of what kind of support are you bringing in to draw in minorities. Uh, I sat with um, uh, Loyola Marymount in Chicago and John Cleveland Marshall in, in Cleveland, uh, Ohio, and their students will sit there and tell you that their faculty supports everything they do, whether it's time, resources, because they know that nationwide there's less than 5% African Americans who are attorneys. Yeah. The field in and of itself is not diverse, and so if there was a push to really truly be diverse, there has to be efforts to attract diversity, and diversity attracts diversity, let's just be real. Mm -hmm. And without that, I'm sorry, as Bernie <laughs> indicated, come August, I'm gone, there's, you were down to one. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to be enough. So the kind of pushback that you get is, I'll just call it lip service. That's the pushback. Can I speak on the positive, like you said, too? Okay. So Bernie also said that we could talk about um, what makes us able to speak out here. And so I also want to say that I think Jesuit Mission allows me to speak out in ways that maybe I wouldn't in other places. Um, I, truly, I, I was not the activist I am before I came to Creighton because of what we think about social justice and Catholic social teaching. Um, in, the, in the adult undergraduate class on power, privilege, and difference, I got these comments of, I'm going to tell the donors on you for asking us to think about privilege. And I'm like, why don't you do that? Because Catholic social teaching says this is exactly what I should be doing, you know? So, um, and I don't think I would have felt that same protection at a state school or somewhere else where justice wasn't central to us. So I don't want to like be all doom and gloomy either that like being in this space doesn't also give us ways to talk about things that we might not be able to if we were down the street at the University of Roscoe Okay, um, well I want to yep. say just one thing as a faculty because there's an implication here about how faculty have special responsibilities or at least special protections, which gives them special responsibilities. I completely agree with that. And I am amazed that I've worked, I've worked, at, I've worked at a number of different universities, how, how much faculty don't use it. Yeah, and particularly when it comes to protecting their own. If you're talking about sexual predation, that's a real problem on campuses all across the country, everywhere. And it's not, you know, somehow a little immune from that. And yet there's an instinctive uh, tendency of faculty to protect their own and not to use their privileged position, and it is a real concern, I think. So, we'd like to hear from you. We'd like to hear questions. We'd also like to hear your own experiences of speaking up here and, um, and, and your own thoughts about it. And um, let's see. I, I wonder if I can get somebody to be a, a runner with a microphone who, who, who's willing to do that. I can do it. You can do that? Great. So here's a microphone. Do you want to start over here? Yeah. Yeah. Shoot, you've been dying. Hi. My name is Theola Cooper, and in my current role, I am the Community Liaison Crime Prevention Specialist with the Omaha Police Department at the Northeast Precinct, located right north on North 30th Street. Mm. Formerly, I have been a Creighton employee. And I know personally that when you speak out on efforts in regards to race, uh, sexism, uh, reproductive rights, these things you get in trouble for. 
So a lot of times when people would see me coming, it was just like, oh, here she comes. And then by me being African American, I'm the angry black woman all the time. Um, I actually uh, was part of a contract that did cardiovascular disease research <laughs> right in this office. From the time of, in the cardiac center, from the time of 2002 to 2008. I find it disheartening that the only time really Creighton comes into North Omaha is to pimp the community for research purposes. There is not a concerted effort to be a part of the community that you're in. Number two, my manager at the project, he came from California. He was uh, culturally diverse. You know, I sort of laugh because David was the first white guy that I saw who knew how to do the what's up head nod, okay, <laughs> back then. And he even said what brought him here was because his wife at the time had got accepted in a medical school. But I have heard from students, I have heard from people who we let locate here that the first thing out of their mouths is, don't cross Cummings. Still the first thing out of their mouths. Now, he came from a diverse area. You know, he, he was just like, Theola, when are we going to time out chicken? You know, stuff like that. But they're told not to do that. Mm -hmm. um, they are warned. Well, no, they're told. He said it was a direct conversation, not warned. He was told uh, where he should live, where he shouldn't live, what he should participate in. Now, when I was still here, and um, we finished the project actually with the with the uh, reward of excellence with National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Mm -hmm. And you can ask Kathy Taggart about that if she's still here. I don't know if she's retired yet or not. She's okay, but I'm just saying this has been a continuing conversation, and not just in 2000. I had worked here in the 90s in a, a profile program, so all of these things still take place in an institution that's located right in the heart of North Omaha. And in my current position, you know, I'm always having to tell people, they hear the 30 second or 15 second sound bites regarding crime in North Omaha. And I'm here to tell you, being a representative of the Omaha Police Department, there's crime all over. When you hear the shootings, the shootings in North Omaha are targeted. And I always tell people what's the 72nd Street, at least we can pretty much find out what's going on. You don't have little Bobby getting a bomb together you're ready to blow up west side and take out the cafeteria lady. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, so I want to get a few. I want to get, I don't know if it's on. It's not on. It's a good prop, even if it is not. Um, I'd like to get a few comments from people here, and then maybe we'll get some panel response. Yes. My name is Rita Melgares. And I graduated from Creighton's College of Law in 1979. Uh, and uh, I have spent the last 40 years of practicing law here in Omaha. My heart is just broken sitting back here and listening. Our situation was identical to what you have described. It is going on at the law school in 2018. I was the only student of Latina heritage, Latino Latina heritage, in 1979 when I graduated. I decided to remain in Omaha rather than go back to my native Southern Colorado because I had children that were graduating from high school and I wanted to stay in Omaha for a while. And what kept me alive was a wonderful legal aid society and role models like Bob, Bob Broom and Mary Clarkson. Um, a colleague of mine is present, hi, <laughs> Gary Fisher, graduated, I believe, in 1979. But it's just heartbreaking to think that Creighton uh, maybe is, has progress, but maybe we're ste stepping back again. For many years after I graduated, I was quiet about I graduated from Creighton. And as time went on, I became braver about saying, I graduated from Creighton's College of Law. It was a lonely, lonely place to be, but the, the broader community of Omaha, Nebraska, particularly South Omaha, the Latino community kept me alive. And today, it's with much appreciation that I say I graduated from the College of Law, Creighton University in 1979. And you know who is proudest of me? It isn't Creighton's College of Law. 
it isn't the broader Creighton community, but it's the, the Latino community that says, you know she graduated from Creighton. So I, I just want to know, I'm heartbroken that we're back maybe pre-1979. Thank you. Graduate student at Creighton. I am a sociology major, philosophy minor. Um, so, something huge happened yesterday. I'm sure a lot of you know about it. Ben Shapiro was on our campus. Um, and so, we had a message from our president, and I quote just this one paragraph As a university, Creighton is committed to its role as an academic institution that values freedom of expression and openness to diverse perspectives. This is true even when we are confronted with difficult issues or we encounter conversation with people whom we disagree. I had to put my phone away with how many people were blowing up my phone when that came out yesterday talking about Ben Shapiro being on our campus. We are so quick to protect the conservative opinion on this campus and it's frustrating. It's absolutely frustrating because as someone who is not Catholic, as someone who grew up right here in Omaha and I came to Creighton because my mom went to Creighton, my mom works for Creighton, and she talked about how it's a wonderful experience was, but when it came to talking about the race portion, she told me about how when she was going through medical school, she came, uh, she was an undergrad in 84 and then medicine in um, 88, and she told me that when she got into medical school, people were telling her, you're not going to make it because you're black, you're not going to make it if you're a woman, you're not going to make it because you're a black woman. There's no way you're going to be a doctor. Maybe you want to be a nurse. She became the first black pediatrician in Nebraska. And that's something I'm very proud of. It's something I tell people. Because in Omaha, like you said, uh, Theola, you don't want to pass coming. And like I said, I grew up I, well, I grew up in Bellevue, but I got family in North O. I'm in North O all the time. And so I tell people, they're like, oh, what's the dangerous part of town? I'm like, oh, you mean where the black people are? That's the part you're scared of, right? <laughs> And so it's frustrating for me, being a black woman who's out on this campus and who's been a part of Black Lives Matter on campus, who's a part of reproductive rights groups, and anything along that line, anything that's liberal, I'm in it. And it's, it's frustrating, it's heartbreaking, and I, I agree. It doesn't feel like we're moving forward, especially if we're gonna protect people like Ben Shapiro on our campus. And I didn't attend last night, but unfortunately I decided to listen. And I, can't even, I cannot even tell you how many times he said black person when it came to a gun. Or the one thing I can't stand is when I hear blacks. You, you, lose, I, you lose your identity as a person when you say things like that. And he said that so many times last night. And I saw people cheering. I saw people cheering and are, will gladly stand up for someone who will lose the humanity of a person. And so... I would like to hear from any of you, how do you feel about how our president is quickly, very, very quickly will respond to protecting conservative messages, and as a person who was thinking about doing a justice and peace study, and I took a Catholic social teaching course, if you are going to follow Catholic social teaching, you have to understand that it's actually a lot more liberal than what we make it seem. And so I would like to hear from you all how you feel about protecting conservative rights on this campus. Yeah, I actually do want to hear from, from the I mean, one more moment, but let me get one more person. That's all right, I can see. I'd like to hear your response. <laughs> can I ask a general question? Let, why don't we let him respond first and then we'll put some more. So first off, I saw the email as well. And I didn't know who he was referring to because he doesn't state at all in that email who was from campus. So in law school, we're kind of uh, set aside. We don't get a lot of information that goes on in the rest of campus. But I'm, I'm going to get to your point in a second. I'm going to backtrack to first and foremost. Um, speaking about being able to speak up, and I think I learned this early on in my life because, quite frankly, I was not born, I was not brought up in the African-American community. And so, for instance, there's a purpose that I had in setting up today in what I'm, what I'm even wearing. Because by what I'm wearing gives me more credibility. But I still keep my hat on. 
<laughs> yes. Because my hat is my shout out to my culture. And I refuse to take my hat off. In fact, the majority of the people who know me in law school will always see me in a hoodie, unless I'm wearing this. Because it's my silent protest that Trayvon Martin could have been me. Not that I throw the hood up, but it was just a symbol of my protest. What you will find is those two stories are, are readily heard and accepted. I'm listened to in a law school not because of the color of my skin or because I wear a hat or I dress the way I do. It's because I've been able to narrate my story to fit whatever I need to fit in order for them to swallow it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For instance, last year uh, it was policy at Crane Law School that if you were not already in the Accelerate program, you could not jump in. Well, I thought that was a stupid rule, especially being a non-traditional student who wants to get back out into the workforce and get on with my life. So what I did was I came up with a strategic plan. That plan not just, didn't just involve me. I strategically went around to other non-traditional students who I knew would be for changing that policy. And together, collaborated how to make change, made a voice, came up with whatever kind of damages I could find, because they taught me well in creating law. It's about damages, right? And so I came up and the rule went before the faculty and it was changed, allowing me to jump in. And I'm only one of three people who jumped in out of the slew of people that I had go to administration and say, hey, I think we all want to jump in, I want to change this. That's number one. Touching back, it is heartbreaking that 40 years and the only, shout out to you, thank you so much, because you are, you are the foundation for why I am here. But don't be dismayed because it's about legacy and it's because your legacy that I'm here and because of my legacy, the next person's gonna come. The difficulty is sustainability and having that consistency through and through. And because, yes, I don't like snow and I'm going back to California, <laughs> I, I will be here in heart and spirit, but it, it is about support. And you have the support of your community and the last legacy I leave in Creighton Law is bringing the African American legal community to support Balsa. That's that's my legacy. For the political, it, you have no idea the political in law school versus main campus. It, it is rapidly um, one sided, and that's just not even one students. It's faculty. But again, it isn't a matter of what's being fair. It's a matter of being able to stand up and constantly stand up, and continue to stand up. And through and through, whether it's, I've been to several, um, we call them the Federal Society, and they, they bring their speakers in, and we sit, and we have that debate. And in fact, um, the last semester, we had the Senator for the state of Nebraska come in and tell us that, yes, we are in a cultural war. He admitted we're in a cultural war. And the problem is we do not have, we do not know now how to have a discourse, a civil discourse in our political differences. So to you, from a law student, it's a matter of, it's one person at a time. It's, it's to say that fairness, and that's, and that's where, where I stand in a matter of, I don't have to be a part, but I can ha at least have a conversation with the other side so they can hear me. I was supposed to tell everybody. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jackie's over there. No, no, after you're done, I'll just want to say something before they leave. Okay. Uh, that there are two things in front of you. One, and we really would like to get your feedback on this and what other things we might do. And also, if you're interested in attending future events uh, hosted by this program, please fill this out. Okay. I want to. <laughs> I'll say something really quick to Lizzie. I'm actually getting like a little teary up here when I hear about the state of where we're at. 
Um, Lizzie, what I would say to you is, I just, the amount of irony that I see when we will protect a person that says social justice is crap in his lectures, but not protect students who want to have reproductive rights or other things and actually like seek them out in other ways um, is very disheartening to me about who, like you said, who we decide to protect. Um, I think that there is a lot of, I don't not appreciate the that Ben Shapiro is allowed to come because I do think that we should have room for all voices. But we shouldn't then, if you're too liberal, say we don't want your voice. So I think that's a central nexus point that Creighton needs to figure out pretty darn quick. Yeah. Um, my name is Nicole and I'm a current online grad student in the uh, negotiated conflict resolution class. And um, as most of our my fellow classmates were always wanting to try to resolve conflict. So I just have a general question. Has anybody at the university or student faculty attempted to resolve the issue of why there's not the minority base on campus? Has anyone actually looked into why, tried to attempt to fix it, done anything actively about it to try to change it? Hoping Dr. Yes, yeah. <laughs> our plan is over there on the corner. <laughs> I, if this is like most universities, I, why does this always end up off? <laughs> if you look at like most universities I've seen, there's probably been no end of efforts to do it, and the question is, are you willing to go deep enough into the cultural sources of why it doesn't happen? Yeah. And I think that needs a real question. Jack, you want to say something? When you're done. Okay. Is there uh, other people who are willing to say something either on or off the panel? Yes. Thank you, everybody, for talking about everything you've talked about because there's a lot here. Um, my question is like, I think uh, Kevin mentioned the LGBTQ changes that you've made. How are you sharing those changes? I'm with Heartland Family Service and I'm a creative director. And, the background's in fine art. I went to Illinois State. Well, it's near me. Um, so how are you taking those solutions and the things that you may change in and sharing those things with other universities or companies like Heartland Family Service? Because we have a big culture and inclusion initiative. Um, well, to be honest, I mean, uh, Creighton was kind of behind its peer institutions in adopting some of these changes. So we were we were actually in, 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 a, in a from a justice point of view that's not so great, right? But from a point of view of sort of program design and stuff, it actually helped us to look at what had worked and what hadn't worked at other institutions. Um, typically speaking, the way reform on this kind of issue goes in. Um, uh, Jesuit higher ed in the U.S. is it starts on the coast and it works inland, and we're kind of in the middle, right? So, it gets here late, all right? <laughs> we probably have time for one more comment from me, uh, from you all, and one more from the group, and then we will probably have to wrap up. So, is there somebody else waiting? Can you want to say something? Yes. Yeah. Um, this is a request uh, because I think what Attorney Malgaris indicated is that things have gotten worse. And to make that case, you need numbers, okay? So you need to know that in the early 2000s, uh, Father Morris and the president at that time, there was a minority committee, and they made a re request that, that there be more African-American faculty at Creighton, and he went out, put set money aside, and there was hiring. And uh, if you look around the campus now, you're, as you're saying, where are the students? Where are the faculty? Where are the staff? very fortunate to have a new administrator. Um, but we need numbers, I think, because it is the impression of many of us that when they say diversity is increasing at Creighton, they're not including racial diversity or Hispanic, that these numbers are not singled out. So I think whoever can request those numbers from the, because they're there, just so we can know, in fact, is the situation, well, it's stagnant at best, but is there any, Real decline as is expected. Does anyone want to have the last? Jack. One more question if you wanted to take one more. I think we have a meeting to wind up. Okay. So Jack, yeah. We had one? Yeah, we need to wind up. We need to wind up. <coughs> so, Jack, yeah. Thank you all very much.
Yeah, so I just wanted two minutes to, um, first of all, thank our panelists and all of you who came here. But very specially, I really want to give a shout out to our students. Um, when Palma and I started um, some time ago to plan, you know, how, what, how would 2040 and negotiation and conflict resolution program could advance um, this type of difficult conversations um, within a civil discourse, one of the things that really triggered, it wasn't the only one, but one of the things was a series of injustices that we were seeing with students specifically, um, Shay, you alluded to it a little bit, lack of support sometimes for students, especially if they were minority or especially if they were black or different or too liberal or in any other context. And, and for me, having so many students here that are, first of all, we have our, I'll give a shout out to our NCR students, um, negotiation and conflict resolution program who are here for their residency um, this week who were given the choice to do something else for an hour and a half and most of them chose to actually stay here so thank you and kudos for them um, but also because it's it's encouraging to see how a lot of what our program is about a lot about having difficult conversations a lot about what type of processes we use to engage people in a civil way a way of how do we stand up and speak up for um, injustices that, that we see. Um, the fact that that, it, that is something that is taking and the fact that um, our students are really representing that and of course I'm also very proud of Shay as a dual degree student from um, the law school and the negotiation and conflict resolution program to come here and really, I mean, in a very articulate way express his thoughts um, not in a blaming mode, but in a, this is what I'm doing and this is what can be done. And so for us, it's really all about the students. Uh, well, that's a lot of our drivers. So I am grateful for Kevin and, and Erica and Fallon as well, and Bernie for moderating. But I really want to give a special shout out to our students. They are, um, like Kevin very well said, um, if, if, if faculty don't step in and support our students, and don't hold and you know are able to get our heat to the fire and just hold on that fire and keep on moving forward um things will not be sustainable so thanks a lot to our students and thanks for our student panelists